Good evening and welcome to the Redwood Library and Athenaeum. My name is Benedict Lecca, Executive Director. We are pleased you are joining us this evening for tonight's lecture presented in partnership with the Newport Middle Passage Port Marker Project as Dr. Akia de Barros Gomes explores how the dynamics underlying the fundamental gendered, braced sexual relationships that were created under colonialism exist in the same form in global patriarchal capitalism and pop culture. I welcome also Laura Clark to the screen and thank her for her assistance in moderating tonight's program. She is a licensed mental health counselor currently working at Frank E. Thompson Middle School and a member of the adjunct faculty at Johnson and Wales University. She has been working closely with the youth of Newport throughout most of her career, something that has continued through her involvement with the Newport Middle Passage Port Marker Project. Laura will introduce IKEA and moderate tonight's discussion and the following Q&A. So welcome everyone and uh, I pass you on to uh, Laura. Thank you, Benedict. The Newport Middle Passage Port Mar Marker Project is very gratified that Dr. Akia de, de Barros Gomes has agreed to present as part of the Newport Middle Passage Summer 2021 series. We're also grateful for the collaboration and support provided by the Redwood Library that allows these presentations to occur. Dr. DeBarros Gomes is the new senior curator for social maritime histories at the Mystic Seaport Museum and a visiting scholar at the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown University. She received her BA in Anthropology Archaeology at Salve Regina University and her MA and PhD in Anthropology Archaeology at the University of Connecticut. She was previously the curator of social history at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. In the announcement of her joining the Mystic Museum, Peter Armstrong, the president, stated that Dr. DeBarros Gomes is a key part of an institution-wide reframing of the traditional narratives around the American maritime experience as it relates to African, African-American and indigenous peoples. She leads a multidisciplinary team that will examine and reflect on how America's maritime histories have played and continue to play a part in this country's society from the position of race and slavery. In tonight's presentation, The Colonization of Black Female Bodies, Dr. DeBarros Gomes will discuss how the dynamics underlying the gender, race, sexual relationships created under colonialism manifest themselves still in today's culture. Having heard Dr. DeBarros present in the past, I know that she challenges her listeners to question prior assumptions and to reframe what was, what was once considered to be common knowledge. As questions arise during the presentation, I ask that you use the chat feature to ask them. We will do our best to make sure that all questions are answered at the end of the presentation. And now I present Dr. Akia DeBarros Gomes. Thank you. That was a very nice introduction. <laughs> Much appreciated. Uh, good evening, everyone, and, and thanks for checking in tonight. Um, I'm really excited to be presenting this work again, and I'm going to ask you to bear with me uh, for two reasons. One, because uh, this work by no means, you know, this research by no means came up with any answers. Um, it's really, it really stems from me trying to figure out uh, what type of feminist I want to be and really at the time how to be a better professor and how to answer questions uh, that my students were, were bringing to me much better. Um, and I also, you know, because I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around some of these things, I will mostly read um, just so that I don't go off on tangents and, um, you know, and, and get off track. And so um, I do want to point out that about midway through, I'm going to start using two words quite a bit. Uh, one is structure and the other is agency. And so when I talk about, you know, the different waves of Black feminism, 
there is this debate going on over structure versus agency, structure being social structures that confine us and define us and, and limit our capabilities versus agency, which is our uh, ability to act as individuals. And so um, I'm gonna throw those terms around a lot in this presentation. And I will now start sharing my screen. And so hopefully everyone can see this okay. Um, as I said, this was really, this stemmed from uh, me sort of trying to figure out my thoughts on feminism, colonialism, uh, and, and history. And during the time I began to do this research, I was teaching two courses at Wheelock College that are related to tonight's discussion and, and sort of um, engaged me in these questions. One course titled Sex and Culture explored sex as a complex facet of the human experience that is, you know, all at once biological, cultural, political, religious, and economic. And because I had students who were mostly aged 18 to 24, the course was also my effort to promote and present a sex positive, healthy, educated, and diverse perspectives on sex and sexuality through a study of the biological, historical, and cross-cultural components of human sex and sexuality. The other course, titled Women and Globalization, sought to explore the question, is there something that unites women as a group and defines the status of women globally? Are women universally subordinated to men? And how do geography, culture, race, wealth, poverty, and politics complicate constructions of gender? And so this work came out of me trying to sort out these things as an academic, but I also felt it was really important to be able to re relate to students and the general public um, on their terms rather than using theory, which can be really abstract and put people off sometimes. And really, ultimately, all of this came from something a student presented to me in class one day that I just, I couldn't answer adequately. And so I started on this, this path of research and I'll show you that in an upcoming slide. On the first day of the course, Women and Globalization, I asked my students to analyze the complexity of race and gender using the case of Strom Thurmond, a staunch segregationist who is perhaps most well known for his 24 hour, 18 minute filibuster to prevent civil rights legislation. After his death, we became aware of his biracial daughter who was the product of a long-term relationship that began with his underage African-American maid. I use this example in class to point out that intersections of race, class, and gender, and specifically how cultural notions of who can bed and who can wed have defined the very structure of society from the beginning of colonialism and continues to do so. As Balland highlights, the relations of domination may change, but systems of domination do not. Colonial discourses of race, class, and gender continue to structure social power relations in fundamental ways. And the body is an appropriate cultural symbol to explore the links between colonialism and patriarchal or male-dominated capitalism because the body is laden with cultural meaning and within systems of meaning, it is always in view and on view. As such, it invites a gaze of difference and a gaze of differentiation the most historically constant being the gendered gaze. But for this work, and, and in general, I find it um, really useful to always discuss gender as being racialized and to always discuss race as being gendered. Because these two things are, are inextricable social constructs. You know, they're, they're bound up. According to feminist scholar Ann Stoller, who could bed and who could wed were fundamental in the construction of the colony. And this included, of course, the sexual exploitation of women of color through rape and systems of concubinage. Currently, this exploitation is still visible in politics, popular culture, and media, but it's all often falsely interpreted as individual choices made by women of color to represent themselves in hypersexualized ways. And so here's the thing that the student presented to me that started all of this. 
I asked my women and globalization students to come to class one day with images from, from media, media representations of women. Because we see, I think, about 3,000 advertisements a day altogether, and only 2% of the messaging is, is interpreted you know, on a conscious level. The rest is uh, subconscious. And so I thought that it was important that we explore how women are presented in these messages. And a student uh, came to class and said she actually couldn't get the assignment done because she couldn't get past this initial thing that she did to look for media images. She typed in, in the Google search bar, white female models. And then she also typed in black female models. And she said she was really disturbed by the results that came up. And if you look at the image on top where she typed in white female models, it's mostly headshots, very sort of mysterious come hither looks. Um, the women are, when you do see their full bodies, for the most part, they're fully clothed. And then when she typed in black female models, we see a lot of full body shots, a lot of women that you know we'd say are scantily clad. And she wanted to know why this happened. And I couldn't answer her. Uh, and I told her if she gave me a good year, you know, I would do some research and try and figure out these dynamics and, and why they manifest themselves the way they do today. And I will note that she clicked on some of the images um, uh, when she did the search for black female models. And several of the women are from the world of pornography. And, and that will come up later in this discussion. And so I started looking into the history of sort of how black women's bodies have, have been given meaning, right, through colonialism, how they've been interpreted. And so if we go all the way back to the age of exploration, Europeans' perceptions of black African bodies were loaded with intense ideological meaning. And the bodies of both Africans and women were linked from the beginning of colonialism. From the 15th century onward, the so-called vile bodies of Africans and women were treated as subsets of humanity. During colonialism, black was not considered a race, but a consequence or the opposite of whiteness. In this meaning system, the emerging social construction of race expressed some of the most ingrained European values at the time. Quote, the idea of blackness as a color was already outlined within Christianity and symbolized inherent evilness, libidinousness, and disgrace. It was in this context that Africans were compared to apes, with the same animalistic childishness, savageness, bestiality, sexuality, and lack of intellectual capacity. Female bodies were regarded with similar types of measurement. Since the times of Aristotle, the female body had only been studied as it deviated from the male. And females across the animal kingdom were viewed as primarily sexual beings for the purposes of reproduction. And in the United States specifically, the fear and fascination of female sexuality was projected onto black women. The passionless lady or the appropriate wife arose in symbiosis with the primitively sexual slave. The juxtaposition of the marriageable woman, of woman and the sexualized woman demonstrates the oppression of both white women and black women. But as we'll see later, historically, white women had a vested interest in the colonization of black bodies. And so when we start to think about how sexuality has come to be defined, this is the origin of our modern concept of sexuality. We live in a culture where to an extent, middle-class and upper-class white women are able to define and play with their sexuality. Although that doesn't mean that this is a type of freedom because of course this is, is used and marketed for the gaze or pleasure of men. And black women are defined by their sexuality and as their sexuality. And thus in the context of colonialism, the erotic is just another exploited resource appropriated for the benefit of the colonizer of women. As in the colonial era, white patriarchal capitalism relies upon the intertwined oppressions of women of color and white women, as well as men of color. In her article, Making the Empire Respectable, Anne Stoller highlights the inability to divide or silo constructions of gender, race, and social class 
And she argues that asymmetrical sexual relationships, so uh, sexual relationships where one person has significantly more social power than the other, these types of relationships between white men and women of color were not only part of the colonial structure, but foundational to it. According to Stoller, interracial relationships via systems of concubinage were tolerated in new colonies precisely because poor whites were not. And so you couldn't have European women and children and families in the colonies living in poverty because that would have undermined white superiority. In this context, the exotic woman of color became a sexual object and was no more a proper wife than a white prostitute. The problem of mixed race children eventually led to the collapse of this system of concubinage and European women were finally permitted into the colonies. However, this also meant that the very nature of the colony had to change to accommodate European women who were the only proper wives and legitimate white children. Importantly though, this did not end sexual relationships between white men and women of color. And it also meant the hyper surveillance of men of color because they were now framed as the potential rapists of white women. And all of this also meant that in order to maintain their own status, European women needed to support this patriarchy and their own surveillance in order to, and, and accept the role of the, mo the moral guardians of white men. One way to look at the legacy of all of this is in the study of blatantly gendered and sexualized spaces, such as exotic dance clubs and within pornography. And again, I'm leaving this slide up so that you can think about it as I'm talking about uh, these, these different um, studies. Troutner studied how dynamics of race and class inform gender and sexuality in exotic dance clubs. Her analysis reads very similar to Stoller's study of colonial constructions of race, class, and gender. Troutner explains that the performance of sexuality in upper-class dance clubs is done exclusively by white women. Men may look but not touch, and women wear makeup and costumes that accentuate their mysteriousness and their inaccessibility. In contrast, in working-class exotic dance clubs, the performance of sexuality is multicultural, and women touch men sexually as part of the performance. As stated above, for this system to work, white women have to contribute to the oppression of poor white women and women of color. And this is evidence evident in the upper class strip clubs where women reinforce the patriarchal norm by identifying themselves as having class while working class strippers are all defined as ghetto. Another area where the legacy of colonial constructions of white women and women of color is evident is in the world of pornography where black women are often bound, gagged, or in chains, and Asian women are almost always depicted in scenes of torture. And we can see the consequences of this construction of the sexuality of Asian women in the recent murders um, of massage parlor workers in the South. Both African-American and Asian women are almost always depicted in pornography in submissive sexual positions. And as the uh, Black feminist Patricia Collins reads it, as passive and submissive to the will of the colonial rapist. Patricia Collins also argues that the sexual exploitation of Black women is the foundation for the very institution of pornography. Since for centuries, the Black woman has served as the primary pornographic outlet for white men in Europe and America. And she makes specific reference to the rape of African-American women as a form of sexual violence and relates this to the consistent theme of sexual violence within pornography. She also highlights the historical profitability of black women's sexual exploitation in Europe and America. Another contemporary analysis of this racialized, gendered sexual dynamic was in Cold War era military brothels, where the goals of extension of empire were equally present as they were during the colonial era and they demonstrate the same underlying who can bed and who can wed foundation of empire. Brothels exploiting women's bodies allowed the US and British militaries to send young men off on long, often tedious sea voyages and ground maneuvers. And the colonial system of keeping concubines made a comeback when, for example, quote, apparently believing that stable relationships with fewer local women 
would reduce the chances that their personnel would become infected. Base commanders allowed Filipinas hired out by bar owners to stay with their military boyfriends on base. In addition, similar to gendered race relationships from colonialism to the present, the presence of mixed race children, the economy of prostitution, and the hypersexualizing of both men of color and women of color have given women of color the pressure of mediating between and negotiating their identities as they interact with both men of color and white men. Although the links between these systems of oppression focus on the bodies of women, it's important to highlight how low earnings and lack of stability of men of color in co colonial social structures is the driving force pushing women into concubinage and prostitution. Women in these militarized and colonial contexts have the burden of their bodies being used by both groups of men to shore up their own masculinity. And mixed race children often present the same obstacles to defining empire as during colonialism in this context and, and, you know, Harry Belafonte in this song sort of sings about this dynamic in the Caribbean uh, uh, beautifully. I definitely suggest you listen to this, this particular song. It's noteworthy that many of these former colonies in militarized zones, such as South Korea, the Philippines, and Vietnam, are currently coping with sex tourism as an economic niche in global capitalism. My focus, however, is not on how the bodies of white women and women of color are treated in these hypersexualized, hypergendered settings, but in everyday popular culture. For example, while Patricia Collins notes that the exhibition of black women as animals in contemporary pornography is a symbolic means of domination, one need only look to popular media and advertising for the same type of imagery. It is in this mundane everyday context that we often miss the fact that bodies are colonized and miss the ways in which they are colonized because we fail to recognize the legacy of colonial dynamics of oppression in our social structure and in our own thought patterns. Laura Nader uses the term controlling processes to discuss the transformative nature of ideas such as femininity, sexuality, and morality. And she underscores that an understanding of choice versus control is central to our understanding of the colonization of women's bodies. The primary difference between colonial and capitalist systems of control is that under colonialism, controlling processes were social, clearly defined and articulated, structured, and often physically violent. Under capitalism, where producers and consumers must be given the illusion of choice, and particularly in democratic societies where social control is less tolerated, Control by means of culture, which is implicit and not dramatic, and is related to the creation of social categories and expectations, is a much more powerful tool of oppression and utilizes symbolic violence. So, for example, the ways we think about femininity, masculinity, attractiveness uh, as women, you know, the fact that we shave our legs and our armpits, no one's forcing us to do these things or think in this way, but it's so ingrained in our minds that these are the appropriate things to do and ways to think that we take them for granted. In this context, control takes place in the form of mind colonization and is a type of cultural control which is impersonal, embedded, and invisible. The primary arena for this type of control in our own society is mass media imagery, which serves as a type of social propaganda. And in the case of, of women's bodies, this propaganda reiterates and reinforces colonial discourses on black and white women's bodies. Nicki Minaj's video, Anaconda, is a good starting point for analyzing black women's control over their own images. The way women of color connect the exploitation of their own bodies to fantasies of wealth and freedom. And the idea that only certain types of black female bodies are marketable. But this again speaks to the colonization and propagandizing of black eroticism and how images of Black female sexuality continue to define Black femaleness. These types of body images are the primary representation of Black femaleness we see in, culture, in, in popular culture. The image of Nicki Minaj caged in chains and wrapping about and displaying her prominent backside, and, and you should also note she has the same type of uh, animal markings on her skin as the woman on the previous slide, 
This in no way differs from the 19th century display of Sarah Bartman. In Europe at this time, and this is the 19th century, the body of the black female symbolized three interlocking themes, colonialism, scientific evolution, and sexuality. And by the 19th century, the African or black female body came into focus as entertainment and as scientific discovery. At this time, white men did not have to look at pornographic pictures of white women because they could become voyeurs of black women on the auction block. Or for women like Sarah Bart Bartman, the hot and tot Venus, the original icon for black female sexuality in the white popular imagination. Bartman's display for European audiences reinforced white notions of black deviant sexuality. And she essentially became her genitalia for the entertainment of white audiences. She continued to do so literally as after she died, her genitalia and buttocks remained on display preserved in a museum in Paris. Um, and, and just to note about that, um, her genitalia remained on display until 2002 when it was finally returned to South Africa for a proper burial, even though Nelson Mandela had been asking for this since 1996. And so we can use examples like this to think about how race, class, and gender has always been fundamental, a fundamental arena of exploitation of women's bodies and colonialism, and how when sex and sexuality become commodities in a system of colonialism or patriarchal, patriarchal capitalism, sex and the erotic are just another exploited resource uh, that is appropriated by the powerful. Collins also highlights how the exhibition of the hot and tot Venus forever linked the icon of the black woman with the white prostitute, both embodying sexuality, disease, and passion. The legacy of this link is also evident in popular culture where images of black female power are images that also symbolize white female prostitution. Although there have always been women, both black and white, who have deconstructed this discourse and have sought to decolonize the construction and exploitation of the female body, little has changed overall. Particularly under post-industrial capitalism, the self-display of the hypersexualized black female body is framed as individual choice or marketing because we dismiss controlling processes. Recent scholarship critiques the basic premise of the work of foundational black feminists by pointing out the overuse and oversimplification of parallels between contemporary black female eroticism and Sarah Bartman. These authors also seek spaces within which black women have been able to define their own sexuality. Although foundational works of black feminism should not be applied uncritically, and emphasizing agency, or again, our freedom to act over structure or the social forces that constrain us. Recent black feminism tends to overemphasize notions of choice and obscures the historical consequences of colonialism and patriarchal capitalism. Despite this, many more recent black feminists add to the discussion in meaningful ways and point out the complexity of intersectional studies especially the tendency for black and white feminist scholars to speak down to non-academics. And they have pointed out that gender is the least significant factor in the black women's standpoint. Much of this is due to the differences in the lived experiences of white women and black women historically. Among African-Americans, gendered segregation has neither been as ubiquitous nor as comprehensive as racial segregation and thus black women do not experience the differently gendered world that white feminists have envisioned. This also partially explains contemporary black women's disillusionment with white feminism as well as foundational black feminism. Perhaps African-American women do not see the same conflict between themselves and African-American men on the ground. And this may be due to the historical ne necessity for African-American households to be more socially and economically egalitarian and more importantly, African-American women may react negatively to academic feminism due to an awareness of the historical emasculating of black men, which is also part of the legacy of colonialism. One ground up approach to black feminism and viewing the black female body comes from hip hop feminism, 
rather than speaking down to non-academics about hypersexualized pop culture images such as those of Nicki Minaj and Rihanna, hip hop feminism is an intersectional feminism, and that just means it takes into account race, class, sexuality, uh, and gender. It's an intersectional feminism that is a conversation and it's deeply invested in the approaches of early black feminism rather than discounting it. And the basic premise is one that rather than treating feminism as though it lends a certain intellectual gravity, we consider how creative intellectual work of hip hop feminism invites new questions about representation, provides additional insights about the embodied experience and offers alternative models for critical engagement. Springer views the experience of black women throughout different waves of feminism through personal narratives and textual analysis. And through our own stories or personal narratives, it is possible to examine the daily functioning of interlocking systems of oppression and offer a critical black feminism that is mindful of both historical context and community needs. Hip hop feminism represents a negotiation of black female sexuality and identity that is coherent and consistent with a non-academic lived experience, as it is a feminism that refuses to draw lines in the sand, refuses to engage in essentialist politics, and insists on living with contradictions. It is a feminism that demands we pay homage to past struggles, but not rest on our ivory tower degrees. It also critiques Black feminism's reluctance to engage in a critique of heterosexism and homophobia in the Black community. Hip hop feminism has the potential to bridge the gap between academic black feminism and the lived experiences of a global heterogeneous population of women of color without devaluing either. The black feminist debate over Beyonce's Lemonade highlights the tension between foundational black feminism, which is rooted in the structure of colonial oppressions and contemporary black feminism, which is rooted in the agency of individuals to act and personal empowerment. The backlash against black feminist bell hooks critique of Lemonade underscores this debate within black feminism. While she applauds Lemonade and its display of black female bodies that transgresses all boundaries and its construction of a powerfully symbolic black female sisterhood that resists invisibility and that refuses to be silent, she then quickly adds, much of the album stays within a conventional stereotypical framework where the black woman is always a victim. Ultimately, Hooks notes, this is nothing new and that Lemonade is another example of commodified black female bodies within capitalism. In Hooks estimation, Lemonade's feminism cannot be trusted since Beyonce's vision of feminism does not call for an end to patriarchal domination. It's all about insisting on equal rights for men and women. In the world of fantasy feminism, there are no class, sex, and race hierarchies that break down simplified categories of women and men. There's no call to challenge and change systems of domination, no emphasis on intersectionality. In such a simplified worldview, women gaining the freedom to be like men can be seen as powerful, but it's a false construction of power as so many men, especially black men, do not possess actual social power. Hooks received a strong backlash from contemporary Black feminists for diminishing the empowering messages that Lemonade provides to Black women. Melissa Harris Perry stated, Lemonade is beautiful and empowering because it faces truth so fully. Even the pretty girls, even the rich girls, and famous girls will feel pain. Still untold are the stories of how many of these girls and women are also inflicting pain because we are human. We also make choices that hurt and harm our beloveds. Even when we are feminists, patriarchal is, patriarchy is evil and must be dis dismantled. Intimacy can be painful and must be embraced. And while Hooks states, in this fictive world, Black female emotional pain can be exposed and revealed. It can be given a voice. This is a vital and essential stage of the freedom struggle, but it does not bring exploitation and domination to an end. To which feminist Jamila Lemieux asks, is feminist work only valid if it performs that labor? Where is Beyonce's space to learn and grow as a feminist? 
why not invite the opportunity to engage with a woman who has captivated the hearts and minds of women that Hooks herself should want to reach, as opposed to branding her as an untrustworthy terrorist? What feminism makes enemies of our sisters for failing to perform gendered critiques as we see fit? Lemieux then goes on, as do many other critics of Bell Hooks, to discuss how Lemonade mirrors her own personal relationship pain, and thus she finds empowerment in it. And here lies the crux of this debate. When it comes to popular culture, what kind of feminist are you? Is your Black feminism rooted in the processes of decolonizing social structures, where the goal is ultimately to bring exploitation and domination to an end? and where there's a keen awareness that Beyonce's position in our colorist, classist, capitalist marketplace allows her a type of power not accessible to most Black women? Or is your Black feminism rooted in individual feelings of personal empowerment um, and liberation for Black women who are able to see their experiences encapsulated and publicized in a way that speaks to Black feminine power? And so essentially these become structure versus agency debates, arguing over degrees of social constraint versus personal choice and discussing representations of the black female body and black women's sexuality. These debates also neglect the complexity of black women's identity with regard to diversity of class, color, sexuality, nationality, age, or the change in these constructed identities over time. And as we're talking about this choice versus constraint, I think it's it's worth noting that you know Sarah Bartman, the Black feminist go-to person, um, you know, in this debate of constraint versus choice, we can argue that Sarah Bartman herself chose to engage in performance, and she herself countered the notions that she was ever enslaved or exploited. Her story is presented in the 2010 film Black Venus, uh, which this is what this image is from. And one fem feminist critic of the movie notes, um, you know, her, I think the title of her critique was, I'm going to recommend a movie I hate. And this is why she hates it. This film never lets you forget how you're supposed to feel about these scenes, about her subjection, about her increasing helplessness. At the same time, it displays scenes from our racist history that capture something true. It's true because it shows her desire to believe that she has free will together with the fact that she does not. A perspective that may balance scholarly feminist perspectives while also providing global and individual level analysis is one that focuses on human rights, sexual rights, and sexual health. A human rights perspective asks, to what extent do hyper-sexualized images of the black female body violate the fundamental human rights of individual Black women and conflict with sexual health and sexual rights. So if we view the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights, we see that everyone is entitled to a set of fundamental and inalienable and minimal rights uh, within the Declaration. And so these are minimal rights because they're not seen as lofty goals, but the basic things we're entitled to because we're born as human beings. And we're entitled to these rights without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or, or other status. And so things like bodily integrity of human beings and freedom from degrading treatment um, these thing, things like degrading images or violent pornographic depictions violate these rights. And so 30 years later, there were additions made to the, the Declaration of Him Human Rights to specifically uh, address what was going on in the world with women. So the 1979 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimin Discrimination Against Women was adopted, as well as the 1995 Beijing Conference which highlighted the different ways women's rights are violated due to gender depressions. And they specifically focus on um, things like media imagery and call for uh, an intensification of efforts to ensure equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms for women and girls who face multiple barriers to their empowerment and advancement because of factors such as their race. In a section entitled Women and the Media, 
the Beijing conference, notes um, underscores the ways media continues to erode the dignity and rights of women in general and women of color specifically through degrading imagery and stereotypes. And this is in all media formats, including electronic, print, visual, and audio. Images that hypersexualize women of color, including violent and pornographic media, are also negatively affecting women's ability to participate in society. So in my mind, including a human rights perspective in the discussion, takes the analysis of historical representations of women of color from this narrowly defined structure versus agency debate about the exploitation and violence of Black women's bodies to a broadly defined perspective on individual rights. In other words, if we look at this uh, history of concubinage, the social construction of the Black female body, Black female eroticism, and contemporary pop culture portrayals of the Black female body and Black female sexuality, a human rights perspective begs the fundamental question, given the violent co colonial construction of their gender, their race and their sexuality. To what are women of color minimally entitled in order to live a life of dignity and potential in a system of white male dominated capitalism? And so again, this, this grew out of me wanting to be a better professor and, and do my, my brand of feminism in a way that um, did not take away from anyone's lived experience or minimize actual lived experience but really um, speak to, to people's everyday experiences and value them in interpreting these things. And so thank you for bearing with me because I was very much still, um, I am very much still sort of working out how I feel about uh, these things and, and how in my mind as a scholar and, and as a woman and as a black woman, um, you know, want to continue with this research and, and speaking about things like um, colonization of Black female bodies. So thank you very much for, for bearing with me and, and listening tonight. So much. Now, now that we've digested all of that information, I invite people to put in any questions that you have for Dr. Tabaros Gomes um, in the chat. and we will see if we can get them answered. Very important subject. Thank you for your insights. Thank you. Yeah, I never know at the end of these things when I don't have questions, if that means I did a very good job or very, very poor job. I'm getting superb presentation. I think, as I said in the beginning that when you present, you initiate questions. And whether those questions are even formed into words just yet, um, that may take time. Um, we have one question. Do you see any progress today? I see progress sporadically, but I don't see progress in the change of the overall messaging. So I see, you know, women who challenge these norms and, and these established contexts, but they aren't the ones who are marketable. They aren't the ones you can sell, you know, in, in mass media and popular culture. So it's very difficult to move, you know, overall feelings about this uh, within culture along. And again, a lot of these are unquestioned norms and mm -hmm. things that we just take mm -hmm. for granted. And so most of us just don't think about them. You know, think about the history of an image that we're seeing and why a woman is being presented in a particular way and what it is a legacy of. And, you know, when you were when the, you had the two pictures of a woman in leopard skin and a woman dancing with a man, I wondered why what the point of the woman dancing with the man was until I noticed that she had leopard spots on her arm that she had yeah. been you know, eroticized, fantasized, um, animalized in the picture. And I was like, whoa, completely yeah. under the radar. And that's very common imagery. So if you look at, um, you know, Sports Illustrated, I think someone did a study of black women in the swimsuit model 
and saw that like nine out of 10 times black women are in animal print bikinis. And you know, mm -hmm. and why is that? And so, yeah, I think it's, it's really common imagery. Mm. We have a question from Virginia Curry. Why haven't cultural leaders spoken up about this colonization of African-American, Asian-American women, females as an erotic other, as an exotic other? Where are our leaders? Why not boycott these products? Well, I think specifically here, right, then you run into the, well, what about free speech? I have a right to, you know, do media representations as I see fit. And so it becomes that kind of debate. I think, um, and I don't know that they've specifically addressed race, but I know when it comes to um, certain things having to do with women's bodies, um, some European governments have said, you know, we will not use Photoshop to make women look skinnier than they are mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, to put on the cover of magazines. I think, you know, again, it's, it's a tough sell here because then you run into the freedom of speech issue. But that Beijing conference that, that I was talking about, um, they actually suggest that states, parties or governments do everything in their power to minimize these degrading images of, of mm -hmm. women that are so commonplace in culture um, in a way that's compatible with free speech. And so I don't, Virginia, I don't know how to answer your question. I just know that it hasn't happened yet. Um, there's a few statements that the quiet, uh, the silence after your presentation without immediate questions means it means you did a fabulous job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> a very good job, just a lot to absorb. And Deborah Washington, thank you for your scholarship. Dorothy, are you or have you published this work? I need to study it. It is so deep. Thank you. Yes. And so I, I published it. A lot of what I read today is from a publication with a, you know, the title is um, the colonization of black female bodies within patriarchal capitalism or something like that. Very similar to tonight's topic. Um, and if you email me, I would be happy to send you a copy. There are some things that I didn't get to in this presentation because it would have been like an hour and a half long if I actually touched on all the topics in that publication. But yes, I, I have published uh, an article on this topic. Oh, good. Um, uh, you did a very good job from, Kay, from Kai Stapelfeld. You did a very good job. I very much appreciate your honesty about your personal process, unlike male academics who so often seem so sure of themselves. Thank you for giving us so much to think about. Well, I will tell you, Kai, um, I had a very interesting experience uh, when I presented this work early on with a male academic who, um, in front of the whole conference room, um, was sort of berating me and asking me questions, I think hoping I couldn't answer them or I didn't have good answers. And at one point he got very frustrated and he said that my work was very passive aggressive, which I immediately, you know, I said, okay, if I was a, a white male scholar or a male scholar at all, would he be undermining me um, in this way? And I, I think the answer is no. And so I think my response was probably completely inappropriate for a scholar. Um, but I asked him something along the lines of, um, do you think I'm being passive because I'm a woman or do you think I'm being aggressive because I'm black? And he got up Ooh. and walked out of the room. So. Um, thank you for that comment. Well done. <laughs> well said. Um, from Benedict, I wonder if we might extend intersectional feminism further still. Thinking of the important article by Erin Trahey on free women of color as slaveholders who profited from black women. Yes. And so, you know, one of the things that I think um, we always have to keep in mind that the oppressed can also be oppressors. Um, within systems of oppression. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, mm -hmm. intersectionality is a really important thing to look at here. As I said earlier, there is no such thing as woman, right? Because you're a woman of a certain race, of a certain class, of a certain sexuality, um, and all of those things intersect to define you and your place in society. So yeah, I think uh, we have a long way to go with intersectionality in feminism. I would add age. Age, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. From Erin Curran, what questions do you ask your students to stimulate conversations on this huge topic? Well, one thing, 
One thing I love to do, though, I think that they probably hated me for it. Um, I'm no longer, you know, teaching at the moment, but I used to ask them to bring in um, a song that they listen to when they're out in the club or, or a music video um, so that we can sort of analyze the messaging in, in that song. And often the music that they would bring in was very sort of sexist and degrading and and they said, but this is my favorite song to listen to in the car. This is my favorite song to listen to while I dance. And, you know, I would always say, I'm not telling you not to listen to that. I'm telling you to understand the meaning behind it. Um, and so I think that that was usually a really fruitful exercise for talking about historical legacies and ideas about women and ideas about men and ideas about race. Um, so questions, questions like that. Um, one of my favorite questions at the beginning of, of sex and culture, when we were talking about the biology of sex, I would ask my uh, female students uh, who were heterosexual if they ever felt like they dumbed themselves down to look more attractive, mm -hmm. to be more attractive uh, to a man. And almost all of them would raise their hand and say, yeah, I've, I've done that. And so to start a conversation on that wow. dynamic. There's a question about uh, following your research. And I think we've, um, you're going to get a lot of emails because you just said email me. So <laughs> get ready. Um, Joy, knowing all this and the conflict within women, lemonade versus bell hooks, what is your hope or what brings you comfort? So I th what brings me comfort is actually as a theorist, I think that you will never get away from contradictions. And so I love the conversations, right? Because I think that um, you have women like Bell Hooks uh, with her type of feminism, right? And then you have contemporary feminists that challenge that. And I think with that challenge, you, you always get some new insight. Mm -hmm. And so the, the debate doesn't necessarily um, trouble me. I think it's a good thing. I think, you know, uh, theoretical debates and dialogues and the dialectic are the foundations of, of what we do as social scientists. Um, and so I think, you know, the answer, though it might sound like a cop out, is to just continue to engage in those debates and see what new insights come out of them. From Doris Cole, you have discussed women's bodies. What about women's minds? How, what about women's lives? How do we have lives until men act like responsible adults for their children and families? Well, you know, that's a presentation for another <laughs> summer and another time, but I would say, Doris, um, you know, one thing that, that I probably should have included in this conversation is that men are part of this system of patriarchy as well. Um, they are given these meanings about what it means to be a man and how they should treat women and their value versus women's value. And though they have, you know, relatively more power than women in this system, they are still trapped in it to some extent. And, and the way that they are defined, the way their masculinity is defined is part of this system as well. And so again, that's not, you know, that's not what I have looked into as a scholar, but I would say, you know, you could do a similar historical study of how the legacy of colonialism has shaped the minds of men mm -hmm. and, and perspectives on the bodies of men. Um, from Sylvia and Soares, thank you. Great perspectives and info. Great presentation. Looking forward to more. Which black women have broken through these bar limitation barriers in advertising and in entertainment with images positively, expressly, expressively their sexuality or expressing their sexuality? And great answer to the passive aggressive comment. <laughs> thank you. I think you, you may have a, you know, unanimous that response to that. Thank you. Someone did clap in the audience when the guy left the room. Um, I would say, you know, I, I chose on the slide probably my, fa my favorite uh, sort of woman uh, as, as part of the solution or part of the sort of challenge to this uh, way of defining women's bodies, which is Grace Jones. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, she's one of the women I would say definitely has challenged uh, the idea of what black women's bodies are and what they should be and how we should define them. And then, you know, a more recent uh, person that I had on, on the same slide was Janelle, Janelle Monet, Monet. who, um, you know, does not present herself in hypersexualized ways, 
but still um, let you know that she is a sexual being. Mm -hmm. Um, Rel Reverend Alvin Riley says it was an excellent lecture. Susan Thanks. Barnes, I know you have a lot on your plate now at Mystic, but I do hope you'll continue to teach. I, I will have the ability to teach, um, but right now I'm still sort of trying to get my bearings and, and get started on this project here at Mystic. Mm -hmm. Um, I work in a middle school, so everyone is listening to hip hop music. Everyone is is singing rap music, and people are talking about the hypersexuality of rap music. And you know, I kind of went along with that until I started really listening to rock and roll of the '50s, rock and roll of the '60s, the '70s, and thinking, "Oh my goodness gracious! It's just it's a different key, and it's a different." Um, musical framework, but yeah. ew. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, and and things that are probably are, are definitely illegal today, right? Right. <laughs> that, they were, that they were singing about, but I think you know one of the things that that I always used to express to my students is, you know, you can take this perspective that women's bodies are being used and exploited and and marketed um, within sort social structure. But I think it's also important to look at, you know, I used examples of Nicki Minaj and Rihanna and Beyonce. How are women negotiating all of that with, within the social structure? Mm -hmm. So how are they presenting themselves within social structure in these sexualized ways in some ways that challenge the definitions of Black women's bodies? Or how are they trying to empower themselves, even though they're using what some theorists might say is negative, you know, negative uh, perceptions of black women's bodies. We can also look at them as negotiating those power dynamics. Yes, yes. As, in, as in what do they do with the money they have made from, you know, their sexual presentation in music and in, pres in um, performance, and then, you know, how they've spent their, the money that they've made in terms of, you know, building up communities and raising up uh, girls, um, it's it's a it's a real conflict, interesting conversation there too. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was great for me to be able to talk this out again with, with oh. an audience. Uh, I'm going to turn this back over to Benedict and thank thank you again. Thank you. Yes. Um... Thank you very much, uh, Professor DeBarros Gomes. Um, really fascinating talk. Um, I want to also thank Laura Clark uh, for her brilliant handling of the questions. Um, I hope that uh, everyone will join us next Wednesday for a lecture by best-selling author Newport local Bing West, who will be discussing his new book. The Last Platoon, a novel of the Afghanistan War. So just please uh, visit our website to register. Um, if you're not a member of the Redwood, time's now to make the leap. Uh, if you wouldn't mind subscribing to our YouTube channel where I believe this talk will be um, reposted unless um, you know we were told otherwise. Uh, so by all means, go there for a rerun of the talk if uh, you'd like to listen to it some more. And um, that's about it. I want to thank everyone and Professor DeBarros Gomes for an excellent talk and also Laura Clark and all of you. Thank you all so much. Thank you.